Well, good evening, everybody. Woo! Great to, great to be with you tonight, Eastgate. It is wonderful to be here. Um, my name is Melissa. Everyone calls me Mel. Um, Eastgate has been home for, for Mike and I for quite a while now. And um, I've just started as the interim senior at Beachlands Baptist. So that's been fun. Uh, been re a real change of pace for me with two little ones, as you can see, running around making a mess of your beautiful new auditorium. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to say, Mike and I really love you guys. Um, this, oh, I know, it's just so special, isn't it? Um, this service, this um, evening service just holds such a special place in our heart. We love you guys so much. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I, think, I guess I'm not allowed to say, but you know what, let's be real, this is the best service, right? I mean, evening service is where it's at. You guys are real, it's awesome. We love you guys. And so um, it is just a real honour to be here tonight to talk to you all. Um, tonight I want to talk to you about a topic that isn't that glamorous, you know. And because it isn't glamorous, it's not, not one we often talk about in church. And because we don't often talk about it, we kind of do it poorly. Um, and I'm all about making sure that we are prepared in our faith. And I want to equip you guys to succeed well in your relationship with God. So tonight, I want to talk to you about the art of lament. Ooh, my hush falls over the crowd. Um, I think to deny for I think to deny that for some of us these have been troubling times is to put aside hurt and anger and worry that so many of us are feeling right now, and that's just not right. And look, the threat of this virus um, has kind of made us a bit numb. The shock's worn off a little bit, right? Um, but it has brought with it a whole bunch of things. For some of us, it's financial strains and burdens that it's put upon you. For a lot of you, uni is very different to how you probably imagined it would be, or school has been very different to how you thought it might go. We have had an increase in depression and anxiety in our country um, and have seen our fair share of disasters. And I'm sure like myself, many of us have had your heart breaking for Ukraine and Tonga and Afghanistan. Um, as a mother with young children, those crazy two little things running around the frontier earlier, <laughs> you know, my first thoughts go to the kids that suffer through these kinds of wars. And um, my, ha my heart just breaks all over again, thinking about what it would be like for my children to grow up in that kind of life. It's easy to look at the state of our country, the state of our world, maybe even the state of our own hearts, um, and the anguish and pain and the heartache can feel overwhelming, yeah? What I would hate for you to feel is that God is not sitting with you in the midst of that anguish. You know, sometimes in church we think um, that we only show God's glory in the praise and the happy days. And as someone who has experienced dark days, I know this can make us question our relationship with God. And I think we do a huge disservice to our faith when we act like life is all cupcakes and rainbows as a Christian. We need to be real people. And I know that you guys in this service are real. And real life acknowledges that there are some really difficult parts to it. So for those uh, who are living in some dark valleys right now and for all of us that will walk through them, this message is for you. God wants you to know that life will not always be perfect this side of heaven, but that doesn't mean He doesn't love us and that He isn't with us. He has given us this gift of lament, being able to bring our pain and our burdens before Him so that He can listen to us and He can walk with us. Amen? The Psalms are some of the most creative and beautiful pieces of Scripture. Um, but they also have so much to teach us about life and how best to live it. And today, we're going to be learning the art of lament from Psalm 142. So if you have your good, the best Bible, which is a paper one, pull that out, turn to Psalm 142. If you've got the next best, best thing, which is, you know, an app on your phone, I will forgive. Um, turn to, turn, 
number pushed the button to 142. I don't know what the correct terminology is for that. I'm not hip and cool like all you young people are. Psalm 142, we're there. Give me a nod. You ready? Great. Yep, good. Um, With my voice, I cry to the Lord. So just again, this is a Psalm of David. He was in a cave and he was praying this prayer. With my voice, I cry to the Lord. With my voice, I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit is faint, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. They look on my right hand and see there is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for me. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Save me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Let's pray, church. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, the beauty of Scripture. Thank you for the beauty of the Psalms and what it can teach us. And God, as we talk about lament, as we talk about what it means to bring our pain and our anguish before you, God, I pray that it is something that really speaks to our hearts, that it won't be my words, God, but your words spoken, um, and that it will impact our lives. And when we go through lament throughout our lives, as we deal with pain and, and anguish throughout our lives, that we can look to the Psalm, and look to these words and know that you walk with us and that you never leave us, you never forsake us. I pray these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Church, I am encouraged to discover how much lament is displayed in the Bible. I mean, we have a whole book named after it. But I am especially encouraged and uplifted to see how much pain and anguish, frustration, depression, wrath and heartache is lamented in the Psalms, which might sound a bit weird to say all of that, but I am, I'm grateful. It makes God's Word that much more real in a world filled with heartache. I think the issue, like I've said, is that we have not learned how to lament. And that may sound depressing, but in times of deep anguish and heartache and loneliness, we can be at a loss at how to approach this with God. This psalm is written as an instructional how-to on lamenting. Spurgeon, who's this old fellow who's really good at understanding Scripture, writes on Psalm 142. It teaches us principally by example how to order our prayer in times of distress. Such instruction is among the most needful, practical, and effectual parts of our spiritual education. And quite honestly, I really agree with that statement. I really feel teaching people how to lament to God in our darkest times is a skill that we have missed off our list of things to understand for far too long. So, it is time for us to learn the skill. We're going to do it together. Who's keen? Who's ready? Great. Teach it to others. And I believe we will come closer to God because of it. There's this Old Testament scholar. His name is Derek Kidner. And he gives us a really helpful, and of course, it's it's riddled with alliteration. Who loves some good alliteration? You know? Um, And this is the outline that we're going to be using to educate ourselves on lamenting Uh, through Psalm 142. So here are our four points, all with a P. Great. My plea, my plight, my portion, my prospect. All right. So first off, we're starting with my plea. Um, So before I worked for um, Beachlands Baptist, I worked for the Northern Baptist Association as the young adults coach. Um, And I ran camps and conferences for young adults who, I know there's quite a few of you who come along to some of those things. Yes, I see that hand. Um, It was a a really awesome time. I loved doing those things. Um, And part of that was we had a little hooey um, talking about some of the issues that our young adults wanted to address in terms of what they would love to see their churches talking more about, what they would love to see the Baptist Union talking more about and addressing. And the thing that came up again and again was mental health. 
depression, anxiety, how to be balanced, how to be mentally well. The pressure to be mentally, physically, spiritually balanced, have an active life, full of adventure, doing what you love, being anything that you want to be, owning your own home, being your own person, finding what makes you happy. They all sound so good, you know, when they're in a fancy quote with a beautiful backdrop and you can post it on Instagram, right? But the more I think on all of that, the more I ponder that to-do list, um, I just find it more exhausting than I do liberating, you know? And I can't be the only one, right? I think we all think mental unhealth is a relatively new concept and that it's in an all-time high. And I think it is quite high at the moment. But then I read the Psalms and I think, yeah, nah, maybe not so much. I think it's been around for quite a while. We meet David, who's written the Psalm. He is praying in a cave, okay? And we, what we can understand about the cave for David was that it was a very lonely place. He expresses in verse three, my spirit grows faint within me. It depicts total exhaustion, the spiritual depression. I'm not sure if any of you have experienced depression before. It's, it's not fun, so I hope that you haven't, but it's very numbing. You know, your brain feels like it's in this fog all the time. Overwhelming seems quite an underwhelming word to describe how impossible resolution feels and how hopeless that can make you. So it's in this state that we meet David, yeah, in a dark, damp, cold, quiet, isolated cave. Um, Many a year ago, before Mike and I had children, um, we went to a wedding on Waiheke and uh, we decided very last minute to do these uh, tour of like these underground tunnels that the armed forces use. You know what, you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Cool. Um, We were thoroughly underprepared, like underprepared. Like I said, it was like a last minute decision. Um, We were wearing jandals, bad move. Okay. Uh, We didn't have a torch with us, nor did we have money to rent a torch because they only took cash. Um, luckily the lady took empathy on us and let us uh, hire a torch and we would pay at the BP or whatever it is later, some sort of petrol station. Um, But it was dark and the steps and the walls were wet um, and down these very long staircases, has anybody been there? Nobody? Okay, just don't go. Um, um, Down these very long staircases uh, were like no handrails. They might have had like a chain, but that was it. And there were these tiny little steps and they were wet from just all the condensation or, I don't know, things are wet down there, right? Um, And as we were walking around, looking at darkness, um, this thought bloomed in my in my head of like if one of if Michael or myself tripped down these stairs right and fell a very 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 long way down because it was it was very long um, and I broke my leg and it was pointing the wrong way you know that this is I know right it's it's extreme but this is where I was thinking this is where my thoughts were going um, and and this thought just bloomed in my whole body that no one would be able to save us. We would just, we would die down there. It was going to be awful. And I experienced my very first panic attack. Um, Woo! Yeah. So Mike literally had to push me to the nearest exit because I I could barely move. Um, But all I remember about that space was the dampness, the coldness, the isolation, um, and just my heavy breathing bouncing off the walls. And I can imagine that all of David's worries and troubles echoed across those cavern walls. And it is here that we learn our first step in lament. He audibly cries out to God, the plea. He lifts up his voice in supplication to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I am so quick to let out my frustrations and my anger verbally to my husband um, or my dog or my children or my friends. And yet I am so slow to audibly express my deepest pain to God. This is a skill and a habit that we need to learn. The art of coming to God first with our pain and our anguish. 
David comes before his God and feeling so lost and alone, he pours out all that exhaustion and depression before his God. He lets his voice echo, his tears flow and drop to the damp floor. You know, there is something in lamenting our deepest anguish to God that changes not God's heart, but our own. It reorients us to be face to face with who God is and who He is in light of our plea. The word supplication to the Lord in the Hebrew is literally translated to mean to His face. Be encouraged, church, to verbally, audibly in the secret place, pour out your pleas before God's face. We are called to rely on one another, absolutely, but that should not take the place of God. For in those moments, we understand more of who we are and who God is when we do that. So that's number one. Number two, my plight. David expresses in verse three and four his plight, his problems, his predicaments. He is being chased um, and pursued by Paul's army. Uh, sorry, Saul's army, not Paul, Saul's army. Um, a snare has been hidden for him. That's what he's talking about. And in amongst this, he is now the leader of about 400 men, all fleeing because they were in trouble, uh, in debt, or they were discontented with Saul. You know, it's not exactly a crew he might have been expecting to lead. And yet he was, he was a leader in a cave, in the depths of despair, feeling so very alone. In verse four, he says, there was no one at my right hand. This was the place um, of a witness or legal counsel that would stand with him like in a trial. And in his darkest hour, he felt like he had nobody beside him. In a cave, feeling like no one understands him, feeling alone and leading those he had no emotional strength to lead. I wonder, have you ever felt like David? What does your cave look like? Could it be loneliness like David? Could it be guilt of sin or heartache? Fear of the unknown? Oh, that's a big one for me. We don't have to be in David's exact experience to know what that cave feels like. I love this quote from Spurgeon. It's one worth remembering. It says that caves make good closets for prayer. Their gloom and solitude are helpful to the exercise of devotion. And as a people who know their fair share of lockdowns, my prayer is that your cave moves you to devotion in God. Amen. This is the second step in our lament technique. Recognize that the cave is a call to prayer. That just because you are in a cave does not mean that God has abandoned you or has left you to the wolves. This is an opportunity to exercise devotion to your King. I think we are in a time where God is calling His people to see the caves of our world, yeah? That we would open our eyes to the big caves we are all encompassed in. I wonder if we've become too comfortable in what church looks like and God is using this as an opportunity to shake up, shake us up and call us back to the heart of worship and our heart desperate to see God moving in our world. It should be making us drop um, to our knees and seek devotion to God. Let the gloom and solitude drive us to prayer, church. Number three is uh, my portion. At this time, David shifts his focus of his lament uh, from himself now to God. Verse five, I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge. After identifying in verse four that he has no re refuge in this dingy dungeon of a cave, David declares that the Lord is his refuge, his hiding place, his security. He goes even further to say, you are my portion. The Hebrew translation of this is allotment or inheritance or part. David declares that in his darkest hour, God is his inheritance. Um, 
you know, I... <laughs> For those of you who have met Mike and I and heard me preach or speak before or talk to Mike and I in any capacity, you have heard us share that we went through five and a half years of infertility treatments and IVF and surgeries to have our little girls, Violet and Lily. And a lot of you walked that journey with us, which is really special. It makes you guys hold a very, very special place in our hearts. Um, it was absolutely grueling going through that process. It is by far the darkest cave that I have ever sat in. When we decided to have Lily, when we decided to have our second baby, we started with our remaining embryos and starting the process again um, brought back some of that anxiety around the uncertainty um, and not wanting to get our hopes too high and all the pressures that IVF brings. It just brought it all back um, and I hated it. I hate that feeling. You know, there's all these tests that I need to do in preparation. Um, And I went to my doctors, to my GP, um, to get a test with a nurse. Um, And that day, I got Layla. Layla is a nurse that Mike and I got to know very well after Mike had a really bad graze on his knee that got infected. Um, He had to go regularly to get dressings changed. And Violet and I would go along because, you know, mum life, nothing else to do. (laughs) Yeah, right. And most of the time we would get Layla. She is this beautiful Pacific Island lady that is forever just wearing a smile on her face and she is unashamed in her love for Jesus. And on that Tuesday, on a particularly low day, when I had to go see the nurse, God blessed me with Layla. Oh, she made me laugh and relax. And then the tears just flowed. I told her of my fears and she prayed with me. And her prayer was bursting of the promises of God, of who He is, of His love for His people. And that no matter the outcome, baby or no baby, He has laid the path and He walks with us. Through Layla, God spoke His promises again over my problems, His love over my lethargic heart. Our third step in lament must lead to us acknowledging that God is our portion. He is our inheritance, that He will lead us on a path and He will walk with us on that path. Through every dark valley, through every green pasture, He is with us. And you know what? Therein lies the power, church, right there. When we share our story and our testimony of our darkest cave experience, and yet we hope in the Lord, there is power in that. When people see that even in the midst of despair, that we still cling to Jesus and they they will see that Jesus is worth clinging to. I love hearing people's testimonies in church. And we need to make sure that we are sharing our testimonies in church, but we need to make sure that those testimonies are even the ones in the midst of pain, sitting in the cave where we can still say God is good because there is power in that. Amen? That my circumstances do not define God's character or His promises or His love for me. Why are these stories important? Because there is hope buried into the fabric of that story. And while hope is great to see when the story has worked out well and the outcome is maybe what we hope for, faith is real and alive when we can proclaim the glory of God even in the cave. We loosen the power of the enemy when we do that, of the circumstance, of the depression that seeks to strangle us when we speak God's promise, love and portion into our lives. And that leads us to our final step in our lament, my prospect. David says in verse seven that freedom from his plight will give him the ability to praise God for what he has done and will lead to the righteous gathering around him because of God's goodness to him. Stephen J. Cole in his study on Psalm 142 notes, David's focus is not on freedom so that he can be happy again. This is the wrong motive for prayer. Rather, David wants to be able to praise 
God. He says, David wants to extol God's power and faithfulness and mercy in the company of saints. In other words, he wants God to answer his prayer so that he can glorify God. Our final step in lament is this prospect that what we walk through is going to glorify God. And look, in the midst of pain and anger, maybe that can seem a little bit weird and maybe a little bit unsatisfying as a final step. And I can only speak from a place uh, of seeing this happen with a happy outcome in my daughters, Violet and Lily. I mean, every time I look at them, I see God's glory. Um, I love watching them up the front here, just having a good old song and dance with you guys. And um, the journey that we have been on and the relationship she's built with so many of you, just it warms my heart so dearly. They are more than an answer to my happiness, so much more. You guys walked with us. You watched us walk a very hard, tough road, uh, road, relying on God's promises of faithfulness to see His promise of children fulfilled. And He is glorified for all that He did. But how does this look when the outcome isn't as joyful as we hoped? Perhaps focusing on the outcome instead of God is the problem. It's the walk, the journey the path laid before us all. And in the dark days, in the dark valleys, in the green pastures, in uncertainty and heartache, we still seek to bring God glory. And that, that is where the righteous gather. We gather to lift up Ukraine and Tonga, lift up Afghanistan and our own nation. We gather to lament the pains in our own country, in our own families, in our own lives. If we are seeking to bring glory to God of loving Him and loving others, that is where the righteous gather. So in every season of life, God's glory shows for all to see. Uh, Worship team, feel free to head on up now. Church, we must learn to lament. We must teach others how to lament. This is how we remain healthy in our relationship with God. This is how we learn in all ways and in all things to glorify God. It speaks to this world more than just pretending that we are all okay and strapping on a brave face for Sunday. I have the honour of leading you in communion this evening. I haven't taken communion in such a long time, so it's such a joy to be able to take it with you all today. Uh, tonight we need uh, we, we meet in communion, and I wanted to share a beautiful illustration um, of the cross in this in this version. This these four steps of lament. Jesus' plea on the cross: "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" His plight: a cross to bear for the sins of us all. His sacrifice, His love, was the fulfilling of promise to be our portion in this life and the next so that the prospect of every person uh, can be seen in the Father's glory. Look, I don't know where you sit today, church. I don't know whether you sit happily in the sunshine, alone in the cave, but wherever you are, we are all welcome at the table. That Jesus sits with us and He walks with us and He hears with us. Hears us when we lift up our lament to Him. I really sense that the Holy Spirit is wanting to speak to some of you tonight. That some of you have been holding on to some really hard stuff. And maybe you don't, haven't found the place to share it because you go, there's so much else going on in the world that my problems aren't as severe or as important. And God is just wanting to say to you, I see you. I see the cave you're sitting in. I see the hurt that you deal with and I am there with you. And I love you, child. You know, I love this song. I love this song because I sincerely believe that God is leading us, church, wider church, not just Eastgate, but all of us into a new season. He is calling us to pour ourselves out so He can pour His Spirit out over our nation. Church, it is time to do something new.
It is time to stand up for our faith. You know, I have such a heart to see the lost come to Jesus. And I feel like the church has lost that. We've lost that sense of urgency for the lost. And I just, I know family of mine who don't know the Lord. I have friends that don't know the Lord and my heart breaks for them. Church, does our heart break for the lost? What about the one that has wandered off? Our friends, our family who don't go to church anymore, who have become disillusioned with church. He is calling us to pour out ourselves so He can pour His Spirit out so that we can do something new. I wanna see churches grow, not because people are moving from this church to that church. I wanna see churches grow because the lost have become found, amen? I wanna see the churches grow because the one has joined the 99 again, amen? Do we not wanna see that church? I'm so desperate for that. I'm so hungry for that. God is wanting to do a harvest in our nation. He is wanting to do a harvest. And you know what that requires us? It requires us to learn how to harvest again. We need to learn again how to plant seed. We need to learn again how to nurture people and love people so that we can harvest and we can see God doing a new thing in our nation and in our world. So when we sing this song, when we're talking about a fresh wind, God, pour Your Spirit out upon us. May we be a people who are passionate to see the lost found. May we be a passionate people to see the one come back. May we be harvesters, Lord who love to see You moving mountains amongst our people. Lord, we know people sitting in the darkest caves of their lives, experiencing depression and loneliness. And God, we know, we know what that feels like. May we have a passion to see You move, Lord. May we not be the same we were yesterday. May we be new. Work in our churches, Lord. Work in us to be new.